Good afternoon and welcome to another cost seminar from the team at King's Chambers. Um, this afternoon it's me, Andrew Hagen and Erica Bedford. And we're going to talk to you about um, costs and group litigation. Um, in a sense, this is a subject that people write whole books about. Um, and what I've seen from the attendance list is that we've got a variety of people coming from various disciplines. Some are cost specialists, others specialize in various types of litigation. Uh, and we also have people from uh, all ends of the spectrum with 30 years of experience and some who don't have 30 months of experience. So we're going to try and pitch this appropriately. So hopefully um, everybody gets something to take away from the, uh, the, the discussion. In terms of the structure, there are slides, but they will be sent to you after the seminar. And we're going to play tennis, effectively going back and forth, uh, going through the various topics that we want to touch upon. But to really sort of break it down, we're going to be looking at the different types of flavors of group litigation or class action, to use the American terminology. Then we're going to look at how this is um, given effect in terms of the costs issues in England and Wales. So looking at some points on litigation funding, retainers, ATE insurance, security for costs, how cost budgeting and cost capping work in this type of litigation, uh, the cost orders at the end or sometimes at the beginning, uh, detailed assessment and particular problems which arise out of common costs, apportionment and division. But um, if we start at the beginning, in terms of uh, the types of group litigation, um, in reality, there are a number of subcategories of group litigation, which I use as a loose overall portmanteau term. We have group litigation orders proper, which are GLOs made under Part 19 of the Civil Procedure Rules. And this is the mechanism with which most people will be familiar whereby you corral hundreds or even thousands of claimants. Um, all their cases are made subject to one group litigation order, and then they proceed in majesty together, uh, corralled as a piece of group litigation. They are subject to directions, case management, and cost orders made at the start of the case, and then progressively at various points through the case, until ultimately there's a trial. We also have, and this is quite uh, an interesting topic, which is featuring in the law reports significantly at the moment, the representative action procedure, uh, also under part 19 of the civil procedure rules. And that may have ramification or, or resonance for some people, because of course, uh, you'll re remember the Google case uh, of a couple of years ago, which reached the Supreme Court, where the pros and cons of representative actions were thrashed out. We also have in competition cases, um, their own particular procedure, collective proceedings and the competition appeal tribunal. We'll say a little bit about that, but not too much as that's a very specialized field. And finally, we have something which I think is probably on the rise at the moment, in preference to formal group litigation orders. Um, we have informally constituted group actions and test cases, uh, most significantly a judgment relatively recently in the case of Abbott and the Ministry of Defence, uh, which concerned uh, one case, but with circa three and a half thousand claimants, as claimants on one claim form. So stepping back a little bit, um, we have in terms of group litigation orders, um, a helpful list of all the group litigation orders currently made and currently proceeding, which you can find on part of the government's website. And again, we'll put the link to that in the, um, uh, the slide. In terms of the rules, um, they are to be found in Section 3, Part 19 of the CPR. And the requirements of the group litigation order are set out in uh, Rule 19.22. And 19.23 gives effect to the GLO. Now, GLO litigation is, or, or, or has been set, um, one of the most common vehicles in which to take cases through the courts. But as I say, it's not the only mechanism by which this can be done. One of the key authorities, if you're interested in group litigation generally, is the case of Lloyd and Google, which I mentioned at the outset of this, 
a decision of the UK Supreme Court in 2021. That's significant because if you take an interest in procedural matters, it contains within it a precy of how group litigation works in English law. So it's an excellent primer, a starting point for anyone who wants to know more about this subject by going to the cases as opposed to the textbooks. It's also a case that was significant because it threw a considerable spanner in the works in terms of the way representative actions are brought. And to um, make, make a, 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 the long and the short, representative actions have a very long pedigree in English law, going back to the Court of Chancery uh, before the fusion of equity and the common law as being a means by which communities or joint stock companies or other collections of plaintiffs, as they would have been in those days, with a common uh, case could bring a matter before the court a reasonable cost. One of the problems with um, representative actions is the need for everybody in the class that is representative to have the same interest. And that can be a problem, as it proved to be the case in Google, in that because the parties didn't have the same interest in terms of the quantification of damages they're entitled to, the uh, representative action effectively failed at that point. Um, although it would have been a very interesting case brought upon the a probably unlawful collection of data through uh, iPhones tracking people's transactions over the internet, what could have been um, was alleged to be a £3 billion case didn't get off the starting box effectively procedurally because it was held that a representative action was not the apt vehicle for bringing uh, cases of that nature. More interestingly, there's been a case um, recently called Commission Recovery Limited and marked for Clark LLP and Long Acre Renewals, uh, which deals with um, a, a, a representative action which is being brought on the basis of unlawful or rather hidden and secret commission. And so that is a case which at the moment is proceeding on a representative basis. An appeal against the decision it can proceed as a representative basis is outstanding to the Court of Appeal. And that case will be worth looking at closely because um, if there is a flavor of the month in financial mis-selling cases, it's undoubtedly the law of secret or, 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 or half-secret commissions and bribery. So it will be interesting to see how that develops as things go through. The collective proceedings regime um, I've already touched upon as being a creature of statute, uh, the Competition Act of 1998. Um, that means that you can bring in effectively opt out as opposed to opt in collective proceedings uh, in relation to infringements of uh, competition law. And probably the most significant case on that is the MasterCard and Merrick's litigation, which again has gone to the Supreme Court um, and is worth reading. But there are many other instances of competition litigation, and we'll look at one of those briefly in another context, the so-called trucks cartel litigation. And finally, as I say, um, the informally constituted group actions or test cases, uh, Abbott and others in Ministry of Defence is one that certainly caught my eye at the moment, where you have cases which aren't formally grouped, uh, but which can be managed and tried together. The difficulty with such actions is that although the, the, the findings may be persuasive on other cases, absent a GLA, there can be arguments as to whether they're technically binding. When you have cases within a GLA, then unless the court orders to the contrary, uh, one decision on the test cases will bind the hundreds or thousands of other cases that form the Cell Board. So that's an overview of the types of group litigation that we have in England and Wales, or at least the principal types. Um, each of them has pros and cons. And it's not a question necessarily outside of the narrow arena of competition law of um, going dogmatically down one route or another. Um, each has its advantages and disadvantages. And so the question always is which is best suited uh, for your particular case. Erica, was there anything you wanted to say on those introductory comments before we, we move on to some more substantive topics? Um, not really, Andrew. I think that you've covered everything off helpfully in in setting that up beautifully as before we get into the issues of specifically in relation to costs. 
um, where we can look, start looking at things like the retainer, for example, or litigation funding. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the first of those in America, because one of the issues that comes very much to the fore with group litigation are costs. Forgive me if I say it's all about the costs, but often um, the costs are going to be one of the most important uh, tactical issues in the case, and the costs will undoubtedly inform the strategy of the case. And costs comes into this litigation as a sort of golden thread running through it, because you have to get the costs right at each particular part of the process to your ultimate trial settlement. So often in group litigation, because you're dealing with matters at scale, um, no solicitor's firm on an individual basis can stand the strain of funding that litigation. It's not just a question of having work in progress tied up for years at a time uh, without any potential return on it. There are other aspects where litigation funding uh, comes in. And litigation funding is exactly that, funding for litigation advanced on the basis of a non-course loan. So it's secured only against the proceeds of the action. And it's thought to be terribly expensive, so the litigation funders would say not, because they're taking a massive risk in relation to getting a return on their investment. And um, it's usually part of a package of funding measures, all dealt with at the same time so that they're all consistent. Um, and litigation funding can be used in a variety of ways. Possibly the most important way is paying for part, at least, of the premium of an ATE insurance policy or policies uh, in case things go badly um, so that the claimants have got an indemnity on cost. It can also be used to fund disbursements, which can be very expensive accountancy evidence, for example, in something like a financial assessing case. Um, it can be used to fund a work in progress. Um, if that is the deal on the table, whereby the solicitors may be working on the basis of a discounted CFA arrangement and the discounted element will be funded by litigation funding as the case progresses with them charging a further element plus a success fee if the case is won. Um, but it costs. It, as I say, it can cost quite a bit. Traditionally, the fees were pitched at 30% of the recovery of the uh, damages or three times the value of the funding advance, whichever was the greater. It's also the first, if you like, of the cost hurdles that needs to be addressed. Because although the big boys who deal with litigation funding and for, who are dedicated litigation funders operating a business have got progressively um, more efficient uh, in terms of their documentation, their agreements, and nailing down the terms of the issues. So it's a very mature industry from that point of view. From time to time, you get new entrants into the industry or people who are not professional funders but decide that they want to invest in litigation. And then the problems uh, can arise because we do still have, as part of English common law, English and Welsh common law, I should say, the doctrines of maintenance and champerty. And if you have a situation where, as I saw relatively recently, um, a litigation funding uh, uh, agreement involved control being given of the litigation to a degree to the litigation funder, then you're starting to cross the line from an unexceptional contractual arrangement into a, one that is tainted uh, by maintenance and champerty and which may prove to be unlawful. And the illegality of it can actually permeate out and start to affect the solicitor's retainers, at which point you've got a real problem. I mentioned um, the um, trucks cartel litigation. One of the cases that I'm waiting to arrive at my inbox is the case of Packer Incorporated and others versus the Ray Tories Association Limited, uh, which is currently um, awaiting a judgment in the Supreme Court as to whether the litigation funding arrangements in that case are lawful or not. And the case could have systemic consequences for other similar litigation funding agreements if they're not. So that, again, is a case which is worth bearing in mind uh, when you, 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 you start to consider um, funding your cases with the benefit of litigation funding. It's not all plain sailing. Erica, anything you wanted to add on the litigation funding side? No, I thought, Andrew, um, what was quite interesting was your reference there to 
the interaction between the litigation funders and uh, the discounted CFA system and the way that one gets set up in that respect. Because, of course, setting up the retainer it is one of the most critical aspects for the solicitors um, when they're launching out in respect of uh, any any group litigation, however, or whichever flavour of um, practical application it, it may see. Um, and, of course, in respect of these, there are the usual suspects that one sees uh, particularly in respect of the different types of CFAs, which um, can be applied to these situations. You've got, as you've referenced, the discounted CFAs, um, whereby the litigation funders interact and will support the discounted element um, in the event of a loss, but then obviously in the event of a win, there's the contingent element which can be secured um, moving forward. So these are all very familiar. Um, the position in respect of the other flavours of retainer, which are available, are of course um, some more well-known ones and some less well-known ones. DBAs, damages-based agreements, um, they're still relatively low in respect of uptake. Um, certainly what I've noticed, uh, I don't know about you, Andrew, but this is probably due to the ongoing problematic rules uh, which govern the enforceability of them. There has been, of course, the recent Court of Appeal case of Lex Law, which approved the non the notion of a hybrid model whereby there was a share of damages on success, along with some other form of payment in the event of a loss. What's less clear, of course, is whether there is an ability to recover a mixture of conventional costs and a share of damages in the event of a win. Um, and there's still a significant amount of uncertainty in respect of that. And this, of course, is despite the uh, report which was undertaken by Professor Mulhern and uh, Nick Bacon KC, uh, which the MOJ commissioned back in 2014 now, uh, whereby the government published that in 2019 and accepted even at that point that the DBA regulations would benefit from additional clarity and certainty. But unfortunately, we don't seem to have had that at all. But the main factor in whichever flavour of retainer is chosen is that there needs to be as a, a specification in respect of how the liability for common costs um, uh, and non-common costs are separated out between the um, broader GLO and the specific clients. And um, what's of more interesting, I think, Andrew, um, certainly that I've noticed recently, is that crowdfunding seems to be on the uptick. It seems to be a, definitely an up-and-coming area of funding. Uh, particularly in cases where there is often a clear public interest. So that's certainly something to watch out for. But of course, whichever flavour of retainer or um, funding mechanism is chosen, we fall back on the old premise of traffic era back from 2011. And the costs, which often be can be quite substantial in setting up the funding mechanisms, still are not recoverable. So these do fall to be under the overheads of the solicitors. Just underlining, I think, the point that you made, Andrew, earlier, which getting these cases off the ground um, can be one of the most trickier aspects of them. Yeah, I, I, I wholly agree, Erica. And you, you can't help but think that our law on retainers is far more complicated than it needs to be. I think what most... Yeah. I think what most solicitors would want is an ability to recover costs from the other side and to be able to charge a percentage of the recoveries from the damages, the so-called hybrid CFA. Yet that's the one type of retainer they can't have, presumably because it's far too simple and sensible. And instead, we have to go around the houses with all these exotic retainers. And they all have problems. Um, I mean, just picking up on the point Erica made about the problems of damages-based agreement. Um, one of the problems is that, of course, they're still subject to the indemnity principle. So I have had a case where solicitors take on a DBA. Um, they think it's a £2 million case. Um, they agree to take 25% of the recoveries. Therefore, their fee should be half a million quid or thereabout. Um, what then happens is the £2 million case actually is worth £200,000. They're therefore limited to 25% of the 250. But if they've got 60, 70, 80,000 quid's worth of work in progress on the clock, they're already underwater. And so that seems to me to be just one example of the problem. 
problems. Another example would be, can you have uh, a damages-based agreement where in fact what you're looking for is not just damages or money, but you may be looking for a transfer of land or property or something, uh, uh, shares or whatever, um, where you may be able to give it a monetary value at some point on some measure. But how does that work in relation to those 2013 regulations, which even now, as you outline, uh, nearly a decade later have been marked as unfit for purpose, but no one's actually got round to amending them. So it's it's all a bit bonkers when you look at it like that. Now the the, the other point I should make is that we're we're twenty minutes in. We're going to finish at five, but we we do like questions, and we like questions as we 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 go along because then we can weave them into our response. So do fire up those fingers and put forward some questions. Um, if we move on to another side of funding, apart from the retainer, we have ATE insurance. And I have to say that ATE insurance features most significantly in the claims of professional negligence that I see dealing with matters of cost. Because often, I say often, sometimes it can be glossed over as a consideration, either in terms of the need to get it or in the terms to make sure the indemnity that it provides for is adequate or indeed um, that it's proper ATE insurance and not a policy written by someone in an offshore jurisdiction who may not pay or may not be good for the money to pay. It's important because it underpins disbursements in a sense acting as reinsurance for anything that the solicitor is funding, not uh, self-funded by a third party funder. Um, the amount can be very significant. And although many solicitors will be familiar with um, fully deferred premiums in, for example, personal injury or clinical negligence cases, in this sort of uh, litigation, normally there's going to be at least part of the premium that has to be paid for upfront in cash in order to ensure, as the ATE insurer receives it, that everybody else in the, in the team has got skin in the game. And the absence of effective ATE insurance can actually impact on the case management of uh, group litigation in that there are cases of authorities where failing to have ATE insurance has been one of the reasons for refusing to make a group litigation order. So all of these points, retainers, funding, ATE, need to be dealt with collectively and in, uh, and in an interlocking fashion right at the start of the case. And interestingly, ATE insurance has sparked its own chain of case law in a number of important respects. One case that's worth looking at is the RBS rights issue litigation of five years ago, where um, the High Court judge explains how he has the power to order disclosure of AT insurance policies, how he has the power to order disclosure of who the insurer is, if that's not apparent, and also who the litigation funder is, uh, because again, these can impact on the decision of case management. So that's the, the biggie the start of the case, but it doesn't get less big as we go through the other areas where cost starts to impact on group litigation. So I think one of the issues that needs to be looked at now is cost budgeting and cost capping. Um, and I'll just outline it in broad terms before passing the button over to Erica. Most people will be familiar with this. Um, part 3 CPR, practice directions 3D and 3E dealing with cost budgeting and cost capping. And now, of course, over the last 10 years, a, a line of case law, claim of authority, which gives us some insight into how cost budgeting and cost capping work uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the issues. But of course, we're dealing with this as a situation where we're scaling up. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Erica to, to make her comments. Thank you, Andrew. I, I think as well, linking in back into this um, notion of uh, appropriate AT cover. Um, one of the reasons in respect to budgeting and why that's so, uh, why AT insurance is so critical from a budgeting aspect, Andrew, is because it largely enables the parties to know how the budgeting process largely enables the parties to know what the exposure is to ensure that there is appropriate AT cover in place in the first place. So there can be the interaction between the two concepts there. Um, but budgeting itself does present a number of particular difficulties within the group litigation universe, not least because of one of the points that Andrew 
just raise because you're scaling up and there's a, a notion of the, this um, ongoing scalability in the event that additional parties or additional claimants join the group register. But one of the most prevailing um, difficulties, of course, is um, that there are that number of uncertain claimants uh, and they're large number of uncertain number of claimants uh, and that can cause those difficulties. However, on the flip side of the coin, of course, is that there are significantly large sums at stake. So consequently, proportionality is less likely to bite than in smaller individual cases. There are a number of interlocking and complex issues usually at its heart. Uh, and also, um, not one of the main difficulties to underlying as well is that it's very difficult to predict at the early budgeting stage exactly how the litigation is going to shape out and how it is going to progress, which of course um, it is the bedrock of understanding um, how the costs are going to attach on to the skeletal form of the directions and shape of the case. But one of the interesting cases, I think, which have come out from the budgeting process is the matter of uh, Sharp and Blank back from 2015, and then also um, the, the further one in 2017. And this, of course, arose from the Lloyds and HBOS litigation, where Mr. Justice Newgy um, presided. And one of the issues before him was whether budgets ought to be ordered to be exchanged at all, particularly in circumstances, because the amount on the claim form vastly exceeded the £10 million presumption. Um, the amount in that was, was broadly 215 to £280 million. Pounds. Um, and the decision of Mr Justice Newby uh, initially was that um, he wanted budgets to be exchanged and he accepted that just because I'm making an order for budgets to be exchanged, it doesn't have to follow that I'm going to make a cost management order but the reason that he did was linking back into that notion of the importance to inform as to the ATE premiums uh, and whether the ATE coverage, forgive me, and whether they were sufficient. So he did order the budgets to be exchanged because it was important, the interaction with the ATE. But then once they were exchanged, he did in fact go on to make that CMO. Um, and what he decided when looking at whether it was appropriate for the court to make the um, cost management order or not, was he looked at this notion of whether it was appropriate to be for that answer to the question to be driven by simply looking at the textual analysis of the wording of, of CPR part three, or actually whether it was a practical understanding and whether the cost management order would be likely to save expense overall or whether it'd be a waste of money. And he then looked to see how much the budgeting process would be and it was determined that it'd be around quarter of a million, so about 250,000, which in the context of this vast piece of litigation was a bit of a drop in the ocean. So he did went on uh, and made the cost management order. So that's despite the significant value and the um, disapplication of the general presumption. So I do think that was quite an interesting position. Um, and equally, what answering the question as to the difficulties posed by cost management orders given the complexity of issues. The Mirror Group news hacking claims has been quite a useful um, case, I think, as well. And in that case, Chief Master Marsh noted that the standard regime for budgeting was not well suited for GLOs, which I think uh, it, it is axiomatic. But interestingly, what he went on to do was say, well, this is all interesting because it's very difficult, but actually what I have the power to do is create an own bespoke process which is more suited to uh, group litigations and I've got the power to do that under my general case management powers and thereafter what he did was he went on and he created template cost budgets which would apply to individual and then to the common costs and that avoided to need, under, to need the need to undertake multiple cost management hearings in very similar claims but what he also did was he created a release and said well this may be the standard ones that we're going to apply generally. But if your case, Mr. Smith, is different to the others within the um, group of cases, then what you can do is you can apply for an individual budget in place of the template budget. So there are is this ability, which is coming out from the courts at the moment, 
to say, well, no, we are still going to apply budgeting. It is difficult. We accept that, but we have uh, ways and means to end at the proportionate results whereby we can still utilize the benefit of cost management and we can still apply that within a group litigation sense. Um, and we can do it within the cost, the court's case management powers more generally. So there is this flexibility, Andrew, I think, that we're seeing from the courts nowadays, whereby um, budgeting is still just as important in group litigation matters, irrespective of the significant sums which are at stake. I, I, I think that's absolutely right, Eric. I, I think the there the, you know when you sort sort think about budgeting. I mean, the temptation is to say, well, our case is worth squillions. We're going to spend half of that at most. Therefore, what's the problem? Why do we need budgeting? Why, wh where's the proportionality? But coming back to this theme of interleaving, interwoving, um, budgeting, in a sense, starts long before you go anywhere near court. Because when you apply for litigation funding, the first document, the um, funder wants going to want to see is your budget. Now, the, 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 the perennial complaint of funders to me over the years has been that the budgets aren't realistic. So, you know, they're done, I wouldn't say on the back of a flag pack here, but they're not, they're not done with the detail or grasp as to how this case should pan out and therefore what it's going to cost. The second point is, of course, that having done that work, it should be sufficiently robust that it provides the bedrock or a basis, at least, for the later formal budgeting or cost capping, which the call is likely to impose. But it also means, I think, thirdly, that you need to start thinking about how you're going to charge the client to the retainer. And let, let me tell you what I, I mean by that. You might have a situation where you've got a cohort of 5,000 claimants. And going back to the analog age, you would therefore write 5,000 letters to those claimants, charging them 25 or 30 quid a pop plus a stamp on top um, in order to put that forward as your, 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 your budget. That's not how it's being done. Um, judges are well aware that there won't be 5,000 individual letters. There will be one letter, an important letter, which was then sent out by the magic of the case management system as 5,000 emails. Well, how do you charge for that? Do you actually charge on the basis of a unit? Will you be allowed half a unit in your cost um, budget? Will the judge say you can have 10,000 quid as a, as a fee for the, the, the letter itself. When you charge the client, do you have to, in the retainer, as you said earlier, Erica, make provision for the common cost and the individual cost, but might it be common cost at an hourly rate and then uh, 500 quid for working out your emotional damages award as an individual cost? And so all of these are matters which form part of the overall pitch of the mosaic, if you like, of the group litigation. They all interweave. They all need to be considered at multiple levels. I'm pleased to see at uh, 4.33 we have a question. And the question is whether there is any sign that the um, draft damages-based agreements, regulations, put forward or four years ago will be implemented in the foreseeable future. And the answer is no. And the reality is that we're within, I suppose, a year to 18 months of an election. The government is concentrating on other things, including driving a coach on horses with personal injury industry. Um, and it's, it's not, not a legislative priority. So, you know, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It may be about to descend, but I just don't see it. No, I entirely agree, Andrew. They just don't have the legislative time for it at the moment, do they? They're um, fair to say. I think they're putting out all the fires. Yeah. yeah. And, and let's just face it, Eric, we've got, I think, six costs in October. So that is going to 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 be the absolute bomb that explodes this year, and I have to say, you know, it's a subject for another seminar. But the the amount of satellite litigation that's going to flow from those roads is just phenomenal. We can see it. It's like it's like a it's like a car crash accelerating towards you at ninety miles an hour. It's just coming. But let's get back to um, our theme, and we've got a number of other topics we want to go through. One of the issues that does arise in group litigation, but arises in ordinary uh, small-scale litigation too, is the subject of security for costs. And this can be quite important because if you look at the security for costs rule, 25.13, um, you have a situation where 
if you have claimants who are corporate bodies or claimants who are out resident outside the jurisdiction, then you've got the uh, basis for getting an application for security for cost off the ground. And that's a really powerful weapon in the hands of a defendant, um, either to generate delay or to derail the action in its totality if the claimants haven't considered and anticipated this, um, or indeed um, to ensure that if the defence is well-founded, they're actually not going to be left with a pyrrhic victory in the sense that they have a cost order in their favour but no funds uh, to, to defray it and then face the prospect of chasing 5,000 individuals in order to get back a tiny fraction of their costs from each. So um, where I see security for costs um, applications as having particular uh, significance already in those two fields, if, for example, you've got a financial mis-selling um, case where the claimants are expatriates, pensioners living abroad, something of that nature, then it can be a real issue. If you have a situation where somebody has taken assignment of causes of action, and by that, it can simply be assignment of debts rather than assignment of a bare cause of action, which might be thought to be trampetous or, main, or maintenance. Um, then you have, say, one corporate body bringing a claim, which is a collection of claims or basket of claims they've taken an assignment of. But of course, they're a corporate body, so that triggers the jurisdiction for security for costs, um, even if they're domiciled in England and Wales. One of the interesting points is, of course, if an application for security for costs is made in those scenarios or others, um, where does ATE insurance come into this? And the answer to that, I think, is it depends. Um, there was a case five years ago, Premier Motor Actions, and PwC at the Court of Appeal, where the issue before the court was, would an ATE insurance policy itself uh, constitute adequate security for costs? Because security for costs can be um, cash on the nail, but it can be other forms of security too. And the Court of Appeal says, well, it depends. What does the policy say? How light is it to pay out? Is it enough? You know, and so you get then after that case, um, a chain of high court decisions, sometimes drawing fine uh, distinctions as to what is adequate security or not adequate security, where there's an ATE insurance policy in play. And sometimes um, you can have ATE insurance plus where whatever the policy actually says, the ATE insurer can go beyond and offer unilaterally deeds of indemnity or something of that nature. But the fallback position, I say the fallback, it may be the, 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 the front position, is when you put in your application for litigation funding, do you need to have something in there for security for costs? And if you need to have something in there for security for costs, realistically how much you need to, to have it because otherwise if a well-timed um, application could cause claimants a lot of problems. Anything you wanted to add there on security for cards? Um, no, I don't think so, Andrew. I think you've covered that off um, beautifully. I, I think the next issue that um, is of significance that um, our listeners may be interested in, I think is the orders for costs that can be made at the end of the case, which of course then tie into everything that we've just been talking about and, and bring it to um, the assessment or, or the beginning of the assessment process itself. I think the starting point here is to note that these orders can be very complex with a number of cross-competing um, cost orders which um, interplay with each other. Um, but the starting point is that the liability um, also, I figure that the, the just court has a discretion to order that liability can be split between the parties in some um, way, which departs from the general rule. The general rule being that whoever wins the action ought to get the costs. And the court has got considerable latitude on this. Uh, and the, the ultimate question, of course, is always what does fairness demand? Um, but equally, within the specific realm of GLOs, one of the and um, facets of this question, I think um, it, it's fair to put it in that sense, is how does the court deal with the common costs of the um, parties and how do, does the court deal with the specific costs in relation to some of the smaller aspects? And what the court needs to do in, in, in global overview is that it needs to arrive 
a, a notion of fairness and the default rule will uh if it's not satisfied then the court can and indeed should make some other order having regard to the facts and circumstances of the case and the usual position for this is that the, if there's been a considerable disparity um in the value of some of the claims but the general rule and the general starting point is that is set out in 46.6 subsection 3 whereby it says the general approach is that any order for common cost against a group litigant shall be several for an equal proportion of the common costs and put otherwise what this does is it protects those claimants within the group litigation order from a joint liability order across all of them because the difficulty with the joint aspect is that if a defendant can identify one particular claimant that has particularly deep pockets, let's for example say that Elon Musk was included within the group mitigation order and um, your your um, local nice lollipop lady, um, is it right that um, Elon Musk should be taking the hit for everybody else? Um, and unfortunately, I suppose, depending which way you want to look at it, the court says that um, it, it's not fair to do it in those circumstances. So the general approach, which is codified um, within um, the rules and such as statutory rules, is that the general approach is that the common costs are several so that each of the uh, claimants within the group do uh, stand the liability in the event that there is a cross order for the defendant's costs in respect of their own proportion of those. Um, okay. The second facet of that is that in reality, what this actually means is that where the claimants don't have sufficient ATE cover, we come back again, and it's this golden thread, I think, that Andrew mentioned earlier, we come back again to this notion of coverage and protection afforded by ATE cover. It has a number of answers at different points, I think, at the different stops off in the um, overarching journey of the GLO. Um, and if there is insufficient ATE, what happens is if there is a defendant costs order and you can't get it from the individual claimants because of this fetter created by the general approach, um, that defendant's not going to be able to recover that proportion of their costs unless there is an ability to get it from a third party fund or under Champerty and maintenance perhaps. Um, but the effect is that the defendant will face significant difficulties uh, recovering the whole of its costs against any other losing claimants unless the court orders otherwise. And there is this ability, as there always it usually is within the rules, for the um, ex, uh, the, the um, exclusion clause or the escape clause, if you like. And that's unless the court orders otherwise. So there is this notion that discretion is maintained. Um, there's been a number of cases in respect to this. Again, we can return to Mr. Justice Nuji, who seems to um, have these types of cases or these costs, these cross-pollination costs cases landing upon his desk quite frequently. Um, and in the 2020 case uh, of the ingenious litigation, which I happen to very much like the name of that case, the ingenious litigation, um, he'd noted that he'd not been presented with any case at all where um, he had considered, or any judge had considered it appropriate to depart from the general approach in order to impose some notion of joint liability upon a successful defendant. So it seems to me that the conclusion from that is that whilst it's theoretically possible to depart from the general rule, the court seemed to be naturally disposed against the concept, probably for the reasons of protecting the claimants within that notional group from any um, interaction from any of the other claimants. So um, that's something um, of a particular interest that seem to flow from these types um, of cases. Uh, there's been a rise recently as well um, and we've, in third party cost orders against solicitors. Um, these are becoming more prevalent and actually I think we've seen them quite prevalent in, in other aspects outside of GLOs. So this non-party cost orders that can be obtained um, and they're quite interesting, I think, Andrew, aren't they, in respect of their um, process and the way that one can go about obtaining them? I, I think that's, uh, yes, I, that's absolutely right, Eric. I'm, I'm picking up on some of the points you made earlier. 
We've had um, a very long question submitted in the chat. Uh, and I say that because right, the, the writer apologizes for its length, but um, it essentially is saying, well, what happens to the common costs if you have, say, 10 claimants and five of them drop out? Do you get back 50% of the cost? Um, and the, the answer is probably not because um, you have to look at this in layers. If you're looking at it in terms of the most basic level, usually there's one defendant who simply incurs costs, um, and those are the costs that they would seek to recover. For the claimants, it's different because you don't have one claimant. You have um, 10,000 claimants, and so you have to deal with the costs, bearing in mind this fundamental difference. Then you have three layers on top. You have the retainer that they enter in, then you normally have a cost-sharing agreement, which is entered into, which may actually be subsumed into the retainer or maybe a separate document. And then, of course, you have the court order made on top. So whereas a claimant's liability for a defendant's costs will usually be several, it doesn't have to be several the other way. It can be joint, in which case the fact that only one claimant wins wouldn't preclude them from getting back 100% of the common cost. Having said that, this is the joy of cost litigation. It's fundamentally a discussionary point as to what cost order is made at what point, either in the GLO or at the end of it. So you've got the opportunity to try and argue the point. Um, coming back to this, the, the last point you raised, non-party cost orders, um, I think the if I was ever to write a book, it would probably be on non-party cost orders because there's so much in it. And you have the situation where um, in effect, the non-party cost order is deployed by the winning defendant when they realize that the pockets are empty on the other side. And then you go after the funder or the AT insurer or the solicitors in the case to try and get back your money. But this is a, a, an area which is very fraught, full of authorities. The Supreme Court has recently, in the case of Travelers and XYZ, brought welcome clarity to some parts the law in relation to uh, insurer's liability and the causation test that needs to be applied. But it is a very case-heavy um, 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 subject, and it is increasing. This week, I've had two cases involving applications for non-party cost orders, not in the group um, scale, but in the um, case of credit hire companies. And credit hire, in a sense, is the gift that never stops giving, but it remains and is a growing area of cost practice. Now, I think um, we're going to move on there because we're actually starting to run short on time. There's two two more topics we wanted to run by. Them. So let's, let's move on to those. Um, congratulations. Let's say you've got through three or four years of hell. You've won the case or got a settlement, and now it's time to have your cost assessed. Um, this is where the fun really begins, because um, you may be in the in the situation where your bill for costs is going to be hundred million quid, and that, I, I say that subject with due deliberation because it has not been um, it is not unknown for cases to run into a uh, high eight a uh, high eight figures. So, in, if you're going to then go through a detailed assessment, you have to approach this in the way that you would the litigation. Um, Prospectively, with planning, thinking about how you're going to draw the bill, thinking about what issues the defendant is going to take, and then if you're the defendant, thinking about how you're going to attack that bill, how you're going to screw it down to the lowest level reasonably practicable on an assessment and probing for the weaknesses in the claim point. So um, my take upon it is if you want to know how it's done, um, you could do worse than look at the Trafigura litigation from more than a decade ago, which went to various decisions and hearings before Master Hearst, and then to the Court of Appeal. And more recently, in the last uh, a year or so, indeed into this year, the Deutsche Bank uh, case, where the liability of Mr. Vic for the non-party costs uh, was being assessed. And again, that, I think, was an extremely long-running detail assessment. Uh, a lot said in that, uh, but perhaps if I pass the baton over to you, Erica, to, to set out your view. Um, thank you. Yes, just picking up on the last one, it was um, before Senior Cross Judge Gordon Zaker. Um, this is the Deutsche Bank um, 
assessment. And it went on for more than 80 days. 80 days worth of um, assessments. And from memory, I don't think that particularly included any of the preliminary issues that had to be dealt with. That was just going through the, um, the, the individual assessment of the individual issues. And I think this um, underlines that, uh, again, picking up what Andrew says, that the need for planning, because the reality is, is that if there is no ability to agree between the parties, um, and I'm going to come back on to how one could do that in this context in a moment, but it is um, quite important, I think, particularly in GLOs because of the scope of them, to ensure that you do outline that number of important preliminary issue hearings that you're going to need up front to be able to group the issues together so that you can manage them in um, bite-sized uh, chunks so that they can be properly digested um, and that those issues can um, thereafter be worked out in order to for the parties to be able to actually properly react and reflect in real time upon any Part 36 offers, for example, that are on the table so that one can uh, ensure that the ability to do one of two things, depending on which side of the fence you're on, either maximise your chance of recovery by way of an effective Part 36 offer, particularly in this context. Um, because, of course, if one has a strong preliminary issue hearing uh, as a, uh, on hourly rates, just taking a very basic um, example, um, one has a good strong result on hourly rates and then one puts in a part 36 offer as a result of that and then one goes through an 80-day assessment that's a significant number of um as a significant amount of costs which are um contingent upon that part 36 offer or that are going to be um falling um uh, under the effect of that part 36 offer and then if you can get those recovered back on the indemnity basis and if you can get the benefit of a 10% uplift or the Brucey bonus, as I like to call it, on the amount of the costs overall, you could be talking in the millions. So I think it's very important to ensure that there is this ability to stand back and take stock because of the significant numbers that are potentially going to be involved. That's one way, of course, of, of settling out or, or working out a plan or, or plotting forward um, the preliminary issues. The second um, matter which is useful is to deal with it in tranches. And you'll see that actually that's exactly what Deutsche Bank did and it's exactly what um, former Chief Master Hurst did in Motto. And being able to identify and properly delineate out those tranches um, to be able to move those forward. It's likely that you are going to need a number of interlocutory case management or, uh, hearings in order to identify those tranches, to identify the costs and the whether they're the common costs or whether they're going to be specific claimants that are going to be brought into those tranches. So you've got this additional layer that is brought in in order to manage the assessment effectively. And that's going to need to be plotted out appropriately because if you're going to have to wait six months in order to get uh, a case management hearing, I take that as an extreme example. It's more likely that it may be a bit quicker. But still, the point is that you're going to have to wait for a case management hearing in order to identify tranches in the event that you can't agree. You're still going to be carrying the can the additional time and it ekes it out. And that, of course, has um, impacts upon um, uh, cash flow, uh, etc. So it is important that you do have this planning. And then thirdly, I think the third point that I wanted to make on this was how can you avoid all of these issues? And I think we hear somewhere where mediation, again, I think can really um, come to the fore and show its strength. It may not be that you can have a mediation in respect of everything because it's just too unwieldy or um, it, it's not going that there are various issues that you want to have resolved before the court. But it may be that you may be able to have a quicker result of a mediation and um, much uh, swifter than you would be able to get a tranche of cases dealt with by the SCCO over a number of days or weeks, for example. It may be that the mediation takes a number of days. It may be that it takes a week or so. But I think the point is that you may be able to get that brought to a resolution um, swifter, which could impact upon your cash flow, and then also reduce the scope of the detailed assessment. And that can have a knock-on effect then as to when the court can find the additional time to be able to deal with the remaining issues. So I think plotting and planning um, and understanding where your end goal is, how you're going to move towards that, 
and being able to identify the specific stops on that particular journey are um, more uh, is focused when you're dealing with group litigation because of the number of moving parts. So I think that that's two of the particular or three of the particular issues that one can see by examining Motto and by looking through Deutsche Bank in respect of how to manage the particular um, intricacies that are put forward um, on detailed assessment. And um, have you got any thoughts on that, Andrew? I think you're absolutely bang on, Erica, in terms of mediation. Because if you're looking at this from a defendant's point of view, you're thinking, well, we can we can bog them down in the detailed assessment. But at the end of that process, it could be reasonably expensive. Um, it can, of course, mean that the real mischief is the 8% interest mm -hmm. which is going forward. So mediation is is certainly something to consider from both parties' perspective. The other way, of course, is of course that you may not get to that process at all if you have a cost-inclusive settlement. And there's certain advantages to a defendant to that if they're in a position to take a best guess as to where the cost liability is. And so this leads back to the budgeting exercise, the cost capping, the cost budgeting, to, to, to think about how you might truncate the process even further. From the claimant's perspective, um, you've got to work on the basis you might get a cost-inclusive settlement from day one. So as part of that litigation funding suite of documentation, don't forget to scrutinise with the microscope the waterfall agreement, which deals with what happens when there is such a situation, where the money goes, and of course who ends up taking a haircut on their fees, as it's unlikely to be enough to pay everybody or everything that they're notionally entitled to. Um, but can we come back, Erica, just to close on a um, point which I think you've already touched upon, which is this issue of common cost apportionment division, um, which I think was the, the very final point that we flagged up as part of the detailed assessment consideration. Yes, I think we're going to have to cancel that, I think, very quickly. I think we've got two minutes left. <laughs> um, yes, truncating that down as, as, as shortly as I can. It, it's important that we understand that on identical on on any detailed assessment what the court is going to be concerned about is um identifying the common costs which are attributable to the um, entirety of the gla so for example if there are um, particulars of claim which have um overarching um points and applicable to everybody in the, in the gla and taking it forward how one deals with that as opposed to writing one letter or, or writing a particular letter of advice to a particular client and how one deals with that. Uh, and the court deals with them under the general principles as have been set out before uh, a number of years, starting, of course, with Medway Oil back from yeah. 1920s, I think it was, 19, the late 1920s, yeah. and then being picked up by Dyson and Strutt, and then, of course, Haynes and the Department for um, uh, BIS, I think it was, uh, Business and Innovation. Um, in uh, the mid 2000s uh, and, and tens, around 2015, I think it was. Uh, and it's important to be able to delineate these out and how the court deals with them. And, and ultimately, it's going to be a factual basis uh, in the event that the court um, has to identify the common cost as opposed to the um, cost specific to any particular action. Uh, and dealing with that as quickly and shortly as I can within a, it's a big topic, <laughs> within a, a 60 or 120 seconds. Um, and it dials back in, I think, with the notion of how one deals with a detailed assessment, because um, in order to identify the division between common costs and specific costs, the court has to uh, apply a, a factual application to that. And what that means is that it's a granular analysis and that in that, that's one of the reasons why there is an elongation of the detailed assessment process. So understanding, again, I think it comes back to um, how one is going to plan out the detailed assessment, um, if nothing else. Um, so I, I've dealt with that very, very, very briefly, understanding that I, I'm a bit concerned. We're going to get caught off in a moment, Andrew. No, that's, that, that's fine. Thanks, Erica, because I think that's a good point to end on because we've actually ended at the end of our notional detailed assessment of group litigation costs. So um, I think we're going to call it a day there. Um, it's been great to talk to you about this. This is a fascinating subject. All we've done today is really skim the surface and then set out the key points that anyone needs to consider 
um, if they're dealing with or indeed wanting to deal with drink mitigation. So I think we're going to leave it there. It's five o'clock. Thank you very much for attending. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in due course. Cheerio.